People in general lost the hope, and electricity is very much connected with the hope in human natures. It's difficult to understand for people who are living in other countries, like civilized world or whatever, how much depends on electricity. It's, it's, it's something very, how say, oppressing, or you feel so insecure when light goes off. You're hungry and you're cold and you're in the dark, no information. Um, and this is like being dead, you know. I feel a person, I feel humiliated as a person. I feel like as if somebody, I'll say, slept on my face or so. You know, if you don't have any electricity, then when you go somewhere that has it, when you flip that switch on the wall and the lights come on, it's one of the most satisfying things that, that you can imagine. <laughs> Welcome to Tbilisi. Three hundred and seventy thousand customers here. And you just look at the scale of this problem. Every light that you see at night is another customer. It's another electricity customer, and every customer wants power. And if every if every customer doesn't get power, they'll try to get it from somewhere, and they'll run a line from somewhere else. A lot will. They'll take it from the basement. They'll take it from their neighbour. They'll take it from, you know, a nearby source or what have you. We think that about 40% of our customers have an illegal line. So this bill is from Tala Eye Selassie. This bill is the most scary thing in Georgia nowadays. Some people are really, really in a <coughs> poor situation. They cannot pay the bill and they, they get disconnected and it's a I mean, very frustrating thing. For the Soviet people, gas, electricity, water, Everything was cheap. The government paid mostly for electricity. Now people must understand that they are to pay for something, that everything is on sale. Tulasi is here to make them pay. 
mm. and they don't want to pay. Last month, we only got a 10% payments rate, so that means that 90% of customers didn't pay. I refuse to cut my hair again until the collections rate is 50%. People have to pay to fix this system, to fix this problem. When the Americans came, everybody expected immediately there'd be 24-hour power forever. To, to steward the resources we've been given uh, in order to, to meet a need in the world. This is why AES exists, to serve the world with safe, clean, reliable electricity. These crazy, naive foreigners who come to Georgia to try and do something, you know, probably to make some money. Georgians know that we have no idea what we're up against, you know, like, <laughs> how it really works. Yeah. In the area we're working now, in Digomi, 11,000 customers, it's a population of about 30, 40,000 people, and we've got all new meter systems, and we're going to go through a crash course of collecting the debts by cutting everybody off who have debts, and then um, asking them to come down to the office to resolve their debts. You know, they started disconnecting customers today. And the first block of customers, about 600 customers, was disconnected. And about 90% of them will be disconnected. 90%? Yeah. You're going to have riots in the streets, then, right? Well, that's what we're worried about, yeah. I mean, I don't think it'll be riots, but there's going to be a lot of contestation of bills and a lot of hassles and stuff. <laughs> Before the Soviet Union, most of them did not pay for electricity and it's absolutely unusual things to our customers to disconnect their electricity line and they should somehow adjust to this new, quickly changing reality. <laughs> Can you imagine what's going to happen in the Romeo office today and tomorrow? <laughs> Maybe you should stop. <laughs> Before, uh, in Soviet Union, people had better jobs, better salaries, and they were satisfied with their living. And after everything collapsed, and they've lost their places uh, to work, and nothing is working now, everybody is unemployed, and their salaries are very low, approximately 30 lares per month, or it's $15 per month. And now they are afraid of future. I wanted to become a very famous and good actress, but uh, in Georgia, can't move, you know, that's not here, yeah, like in Hollywood. I'm just dancer, dancer, yeah, Georgia national dancer. In the evening, central, on weekend, central.
when I have free time. because she is working here, but the other people who does not work, it's too expensive for them. Why are they not have light at all, he says. If we don't have money, we, we won't pay. So. He's inviting us uh, to drink some wine. It's better now, she said, the electricity. Sometimes she minds her. Why did you say that you are satisfied? <laughs> But we are not satisfied. Why are you are saying that we are not satisfied? No, 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 so frequently gets completely devastated by all these big neighbors. <laughs> the Persians, the Turks, the Russians, the Mongols, Tamerlane, they've all been here and smashed the place up. The country which situates in such a remote areas let's say, remote from the sense of modern civilization, Western countries. Who are our neighbors right now? Turkey, it's an aggressive country and it has many problems with human rights, of course, and the ethnic problems. So, why at Turkey we can't get anything positive, let's say? More or less, I don't know. Is Armenia our neighbor, which is also in the shit like Georgia? It has almost the same problems, I mean, which post-Soviet countries have, even worse than Georgia economically, more isolated. Azerbaijan, which has only oil, it's also ruled by mafioso people, same, nothing we can gain from Azerbaijan except of maybe cheap oil. And North the Russia, stupid Russia with its problem, its Caucasus war in Chechenia. Politically we are in very bad condition and it influences economically too. Georgia was a real surprise because I didn't know Georgia existed, I knew nothing of the Caucasus and I came here because there was no electricity on, a, on some, for some work. And I really fell in love with the kind of mystery of the place.
people from all over the old world here. It's a real polyglot nexus. Georgians are hard to get a sense of. They're complex, certainly. There are deep roots to what they do and how they think and why they do things. And, and understanding that's been a long sort of journey. The language in itself is so very difficult. It's like a secret code for the Georgians. <laughs> I was born in London. I started traveling when I was very young. I moved to the States when I was a teenager sort of an outsider then, lived in Central America for about four or five years, and just got used to the role of being an outsider. To continue to do that, when you get comfortable somewhere, you have to go somewhere else, because otherwise you're not an outsider anymore. I've right? been here for four years now. I, I like to try and understand a place and to learn languages, and I'm interested in the world and in different people, so the best way to do that is to go and live places. that it uh, gives a uh, person, if he wants to have a long hair, it's quite a personality, adds something to his personality. Then I have a teenager daughter who likes long hair very much, so I'm more or less used to this. <laughs> he won't cut it unless everything is okay, he tells us. We put these meter boxes in at our expense entirely, $100 per customer, so that we can build the Talassi customer relationship in a clearly defined way. That's the basis of the relationship, ultimately, is the meter. The key to Talassi's success is the re-metering project. It's their only way of collecting revenue. Talassi has hired the Black and Beach as a project of installation and re-metering the whole of Tbilisi. We're up to very, very close to 6,000 meters a week, which is big numbers, which we were told couldn't be achieved. just for a view of Didi Digomi, you can really see the layout of what they were going to build. That's what happens when the Russians leave. I don't know what happened in other states, obviously. I don't know, Georgia probably took it a bit worse than most of them because of its location. It was 1988, it all finished. And they just sort of like upped and left. Left everything really there, all the cranes, all the footings, and uh, quite a lot of partly finished buildings. It's a lot of refugees living them, and obviously people who have like got nowhere else to live. It's cheap, I should imagine. These buildings were finished, but I think we think the customers have put the installation in themselves. Customers just hook up whatever they want, however they want. The whole connection is illegal. There's zero collection here, probably. There's no metered collection anyway. Cable's been so badly overheated, it's actually bare. It's got no insulation on it. I mean, it just peels off. Um, we don't touch any of this, be honest, because it's, <laughs> you're not electrocuting yourself. The customers are saying they're forced to do this. They claim they have permission to live in these blocks, so uh, they've had to put some electricity on. I mean, it's very difficult in this day and age to live without electricity. Talassi obviously wouldn't install for them. It's like the edge of the city, it's like the forgotten part. Bit of a wasteland, isn't it? But then again, I uh, really shouldn't judge. I mean, people have survived really well. They've been through a lot. We're going to have a look at one of the kiosks in one of the buildings over there where they've got lots of illegals. This is probably the worst one I've ever seen, actually. This is why we brought you here. I've watched the cables. It's against regulations for uh, clearance as well, somehow. <laughs> uh, have a look in there. There's actually a burnout on one of the neutrals that in progress. It's giving off a lot of heat. Be very careful in here because it's live. Everything's live. All the insulation's melting off, as you can see. This was more typical when we came here, right? This is what it was like, you know. Burnt switches, phases gone. Um, 
cable installed like this. I mean, what the rock's for, I don't know. Counterweight to hook on there. I mean, don't touch anything metal, by the way, because uh, chances are it's like. The most amazing thing is it's got fuses in it, so maintenance have come in here and fused the system. But the system's so fragile, it's like hanging together by nothing. I mean, it's, it's, it's a scrap. I mean, they're using everything, telephone cable to run power. But that's giving off really big heat. You can actually hear it burning. The transformer room's open as well now. We won't go in, because not of a metal floor. Don't, even 6 kV that is, Wayne, don't go in. Simple as that, don't go in. This is uh, the main incomer chamber for 6 kV, don't go in though, because I'll tell you what, if that floor comes live, we're fucking dead. Because we've got sparking going on over there and it's like, we don't know what it is over there. As you walk over there, it's like sparks are falling down, but I'm not going in there, put it that way. <laughs> I value my life. This is what maintenance have to work with to start with, you know what I mean? They've got, they've got a big job. It looks so broken down and decrepit, mm -hmm. but there's such, there's incredible, like, you know, like energy and initiative and skills and, you know, ability and desire to, to, to attain a capability, you know, like motivation, you know, that sparkle, the energy, it's there, you know, and it's like, where does that come from, you know, like, to a point of sophistication and, and where, with, ability to speak three, four, five languages, mm. you know, very well, uh, and never even having left Tbilisi. Mm. You know, that's a cultural thing, definitely. Mm. Mm. When the light goes off, she feels insecure. Because television means, means so much to her, you know, now. Because she's 87, she has 12 lari pension, which is $6 or so. And I'm never at home. And the only thing, only her friend is television. So in winter, when light comes only at 8 o'clock at, at night, so she waits for this light, for like, like for, like, for some, someone really very special in her life or so. I started to use an alcohol, you know, <laughs> to be more happy because when you have food, you have warm, you have fireplace, you have alcohol a little bit and nothing to do because my old apartment is full with some high-tech, let's say, computers, fax, email, <laughs> internet, <laughs> it's strange. You have all this very, let's say, expensive stuff and it's useless. Now we are on the way to Karsani. Karsani, we can say it's like my homeland or my shelter. It's a small, tiny village, just 20 kilometers from Tbilisi, from my house. Uh, we have a very little amount of grapes here, actually maximum we can harvest 500 kilos, but this year um, most of harvest was eaten by the birds. We harvested a little bit and in this very, very, let's say, primitive way we are making the wine juice. Very good, very tasty, let's say peasant wine without any chemicals, but very little amount. Georgians still, while we are very ancient winemakers, we, we still have some honor for traditional rituals. We like to have our own wine. As a person who been quite close to social anthropology, since Perestroika started, I knew that bad times were coming. I decided to have a cows here. Usually, the young 
cows or calves are very cheap. Uh, so step by step we started to have a milking cows. Cheese we are making also ourselves. I started when uh, we had the six milking cows, I started to sell the cheese same time. In very bad years, when everything collapsed, well, all around of Georgia there was a civil war, there were ethnic conflicts, but we always had milk, cheese, meat also. So this small piece of land and this, let's say, farm, economically saved our life. We did first uh, cut-off day today. They have some complaints and they say that all the bills are incorrect. <laughs> Yeah, 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 I heard, yeah, that's a lot of the, like, the dead information is not correct and stuff. Yeah, that's not figured out, yeah. yeah. I think this is right mm -hmm. debt, but people uh, don't agree with us. If she write, we say, I'm sorry. Getting them all to pull together, that requires the professional information systems project manager with 20 years experience to come and work with them permanently because we're not just running a system. We're creating, inventing, developing, testing. It's just a huge project, you know. They can't do it, you know. I mean, they can do it if they're given more tools. See, like, the thing is, Mike, if you like what we do, then help us, like, get this through and get these ideas over in a big way. Because this is the dope here. This is the spice of what our business is. And if we're not dealing with these problems and making this stuff work at this level, then what are we doing here? Huh? Yes, everybody knows my name. You know, I'll go to a bar or a restaurant or something else and find some complete strangers pay the bill. I've got no idea who paid it. Which is, which is you know, in some ways it's quite nice, but at the other time you always feel you're on a show. Where else do you see the head of the power company that's a national celebrity on television? It's not normal, is it? Mike's responsible for this huge company. It's Mike's project. He bid it. It's this incredible pressure. A lot of money involved and it's a tough job. When Mike bought Talassi, the Georgians, I knew they were saying, oh, poor guy, he's such a nice boy, and he has no idea what he's getting into. Uh, I know him, Skoll. Yeah. <laughs> Mike Skoll? Yeah, Skoll. You may not know him? Yeah, of course. Oh, right. yeah. I'm never conscious of it, but sometimes when I'm thinking, this eyebrow raises up. I just, I can't do it voluntarily at all. <laughs> they made fun of it on a cartoon. I'm sort of thumping the table saying, OK, guys, fucking cancel area. No money, no electricity. Cut off this fucking electricity to all debtors. His eyebrows are going, tch, 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 tch. Hey, subliminal kind of habits. <laughs> We found out from today that a lot of bills that are paid by customers, we don't have records of those payments in the computer or in the old books. So payments made at our cashier are not making it back to Tallahassee, which means that the money was pocketed either by our cashier or by the people at the post bank or by somebody between the salary and our computer. The amount of work for those women, you know, that you saw today, they're completely overloaded. Reconciling all these debts, settling all these debts, mm -hmm. and 
then to ask them to photocopy all bills the customers produce that we have no record of and then to trace all of those bills that we have no record of is just an undertaking that you know it's going to be impossible to to manage that you know I mean, just truly I'm just showing a little of your notes. Pelasi used to use this when we came. Step from here to here. It's a big progress. <laughs> what was and what is. <laughs> so I am in charge for collection for three phase customers. TV tower, for example, factories, commercial shops, supermarkets. Everything except residential customers. The airport actually had a debt for uh, power for some time, so the uh, one of the guys in charge of cutting off the, you know, getting the bills from the airport, he cut the airport off. I got information that airplane was going to land to this aircraft factory airport. When a plane was coming to land, we all of a sudden just turned them off. Airplane was coming for five minutes. And they freaked out and paid the bill instantly, man. Imagine if they are paying after you disconnect. So it means that they have to, they have money to pay, or they can get money to pay their power bill. But anyway, you have to do this kind of stuff. TV tower, I disconnected. Yes, it was uh, it's bad things. It's. Disaster, you know, when you have to disconnect these kind of facilities. It's a disaster. It shows how, how bad the situation is in this country, you know. Maybe it's because of corruption. Maybe it happened because people are not accustomed to pay their power bill. Darren's a local boy. He's a Georgian, of course. He went to the seminary in Tbilisi. He got hooked up with the Bolsheviks and ended up rising to the top of the pile. Unbelievable organizational skills the Bolsheviks had. But what they used to do it was fear. The Soviets trained everybody to focus on all these details and forget the big picture and the concepts. It's a way of social control. Build walls between people. Have people focus on being a little cog in the machine but don't think about the big picture. And that's a Soviet thing. These are the older Tlasi guys that built the system. Their average age in here is probably about 60. They were born in the 40s, just before the war. Teenagers when Stalin died. They saw Tlasi just fall apart. The whole company just began fall apart and get eaten up by thugs and mafiosi and stuff. And they're rebuilding the company now. It's enough. 12 guys, it's enough for to do everything. What you told me. Okay, why are you worried that suddenly tomorrow they will have no job? It's, uh, when, when something is uh, changing, uh, it's um, always uh, oh, we have some doubt in it. In addition to who you have, you need uh, 25 <laughs> more people. And I think uh, that the problem here is not the number of people, it's the vision of managers. Don't describe the past. Mm -hmm. That's not it. What's in the past is done. <laughs> Talk about the future, where you want to go. <laughs> vision, you know, new, new vision. I want training, management training, fuel for the future. You know? So next week, okay, 
bring somebody who's less than 35 to this meeting every week you can have and let's really train managers and let's shake this up you know like let's for the future you know at the highest level we don't believe the purpose of a corporation is to, to profit maximize and this was a very radical concept thinking beyond the bottom line that's not the wider agenda it doesn't mean we're a bunch of crazy people wearing sandals business has to be business but the idea of sustaining the business and growing the business is not just to make you know make profits to try and put something back and this may be an extreme example of that in terms of replacing the power supply to a city when it's been fairly well devastated over the past five or six years I like ideology of this company. Give responsibility to lowest level. Let him make decision himself. Let him make mistakes and correct his mistakes. AES is the first multinational I ever worked for. I never thought I would ever be in this situation, no? but I really believe in what I'm doing and I think that AES is a very good venue to do it in. That's how I like to work. Facilitate people taking on responsibility. You get enjoyment from that. You take ownership of that and you put more of your soul into it. And the results are incredible. But it requires you to be close to people. This is very post-postmodern Western management techniques. And here we are in the former Soviet Union, the land of total verticalism. And it's a huge culture clash. AES's values are integrity, fairness, social responsibility and fun. I think sometimes the perception is, oh, it's impossible for a company to have these values, especially a corporate American company. See, what you're trying to do is transition the people and the community in this business to, you know, a capitalist uh, way of doing business. Some of the customers aren't too happy with that. Originally, they busted the meter cabinets. Now they've gone back to the kiosk, broke the lock, switch themselves back on and put their own lock on the kiosk there so we can't get in and re-disconnect them. They damaged the, uh, the window here and removed some seals off of a meter here. Doesn't look like they really did anything else. It looks like maybe they just out of aggression smashed the meter. What we need to do is put a letter on the meter cabinet. This equipment is critical in bringing you the electricity. If you, if you destroy the cabinet, you're not going to have a means for having electricity brought to you. So here, it looks like they've defeated the lock. More than likely, what they wanted to do is get in and make and make an illegal connection, right? If you've been disconnected somewhere else, what you can do is just come in and bring two wires here and connect to either any one of these positions right here. So potentially you could grab one of these uh, fuse positions here and come in contact with 220 volts. This is not dangerous, this is deadly. Somebody can touch that and die, right? That's why it's in a cabinet and it's locked. Well, right now we really don't know what the reason was. These substations are extremely dangerous, and we'd just like to stress to the people of Tbilisi, please, please, stay out of these places. We have uh, disconnected about 12 buildings. These customers realize that these are Telasi people. So nearly all the population in this building came down, surrounded them, didn't let them to go anywhere, didn't let them to make their jobs, and some tension and shouting. We went there and talked to customers about one and a half hours. They also uh, were trying to push us. We found that all the meter boxes were damaged. Then we uh, made the decision to reconnect all the customers, all of them, not just uh, them uh, who paid the bills. So now we uh, are making the decision that we should decrease the pressure and uh, to uh, disconnect just for the current consumption, the last meter reading. AES McVari generates electricity to the Georgian grid. We bill the wholesale energy market, and the wholesale energy market has not paid AES McVari a single lari since we started operation here. 
So what we are asking for is money from the wholesale energy market so that we can generate electricity. AES Gardabani is a gas-fired power station that AES purchased to help us with our supply of power. You can't sell what you don't have. So we purchased the generating station to go hand in hand with the distribution company. We operate about 40 kilometers outside the capital city of Tbilisi to provide anywhere is up to 75% of all the electricity in Georgia in the wintertime. How much is the debt? 22 million lari. This is our number 10 unit. This is one of the two most famous uh, generating units in all of the Caucasus. We burn gas in the boilers. The boilers run at super critical pressure. The steam turns the turbine in three stages. That in turn spins the generator. The generator causes the electricity to be made and out comes the power onto the Georgian grid. We want to generate in Georgia. Georgia needs us to generate. To do that I need gas. And I cannot buy gas without money. This place needs jobs. Nobody's going to come in here and open up a factory that doesn't have electricity. I don't want to get into politics. I am simply a person who makes electricity for Georgia. And I need to be paid for my electricity so I can buy gas. The key is 24-hour power or close to it in Tbilisi this winter. If that happens, we'll really turn a major corner here. They had burning barricade across this road here because of the electrical problem. This winter was the toughest winter. This winter is, is bad, you know. It tears off your nerves, nervous system. Your mentality is not normal when there's no electricity. And also you cannot work properly. The issue here really isn't so much that they're disconnected because even if these customers had paid their bill and we hadn't disconnected them, there still would be no electricity right now because of uh, there's a deficit of electricity in, uh, in Tbilisi here. In a day, it's uh, about uh, four or five hours of electricity and uh, other time we're in darkness. <laughs> This is a crazy thing, is that this could be like a street in Italy or in Spain or wherever. Look, you know, you've got these fancy cars, you know, there's houses being built, there's money around here. But there's no electricity, right? What's going on? down a whole load of walls and put in partitions and put in glass and try and open it up and make it a workspace for people to interact rather than sit behind closed doors. These guys before they moved here were squeezed in, oh, I don't know, three or four tiny little offices, one floor down and two floors down. And clearly what they need to do is interact a whole lot more. And therefore, again, open the whole thing up. This will be all changed too. 
This is my room. See, Jejero, it's all open because I just got the job, so I'm just, you know, open door policy and, you know, meetings, a lot of talking. Well, I just got this job about uh, three weeks ago. It's the big factory region of Tbilisi. It's the largest in area. It's got the second largest number of customers, 100,000 customers. It's got a huge share of the, of the city's industry, which has obviously collapsed. So a lot of unemployment. We lose about $2 million a month now on the difference between our supplies and our collections. So this is the $2 million a month lost team, you know, right here. Now we have the electricity only. When do we have it? We don't you never know, know when it comes and when it you know, leaves. They don't even set up it, any, any kind of schedule. Mainly it's after 9 o'clock. Mm. Last year it was after 7 o'clock, but now it's after 9 o'clock. You know, Until 12. Yeah. When is there no light? You're obsessed when the light is coming. And when light comes, then you're obsessed when, is, when, is this, when they are going to shut it down. There has been uh, huge pressure right from the very beginning of the program. Uh, it was coming both from the government and on the other hand we had some gang people coming and threatening uh, each journalist. I also had, for example, people coming and uh, you know, promising to kill me. Factors and clans that don't pay for the electricity are still receiving it regularly. Those power plants are owned by the uh, relatives of president, and everyone knows that, and uh, this is the issue discussed widely um, in the whole media. But yet, uh, this is going on all the time. Zoti is a big chemicals plant. It's one of these huge old kind of Soviet-era combinants. They received something like 13 million lives worth of power, which is about $6 million worth of power last year. Didn't pay anything for that. That would be enough to almost power the whole of Tbilisi for one month during the winter. You take power, you've got to pay for it. And that message is the same for a residential customer as it is for a big industrial customer. And nobody was disconnecting them because these guys were so powerful. And ultimately, the combination of the pressure from us and those demonstrations got some of these guys disconnected. So you can count it as a success. In any power system anywhere in the world, the National Dispatch Center is a very important place. All the regional dispatch centers and all the local switching and you know transformer stations, they work under the strict control of that dispatch center. But what's happened in Georgia is it's all kind of broken down. There's a lot of bribery and corruption, you know, allegedly in this system. Because people who are not being paid a salary or paid very low salaries, they're the guys in charge of the switches. So they may be like, okay, if I have 10 megawatts tonight and I can give it to one of four feeders, uh, the one that gave me some money or took me out to dinner last week, you know, and my salary is like nothing and I haven't been paid for six months anyway, what are you going to do, you know? I mean, that's the way the system works. You can't blame those people. I had talks with the representatives of the ministry and they said, you know, don't you know how the president actually uh, appoints the ministers? The major criteria for that is that if they are providing free energy for their relatives, that's the major criteria for a person to be appointed as a minister for in Georgia. And the ministry, in theory, is in charge of policy. Yeah, well, policy to me doesn't include phoning up dispatch and saying, Connect this customer right now. Me arma bo mosakhlo bo zepo porto ma unda miigo z elektroenergie va tonu xara. Ma kontrole boli punksia chue nara gol dispecherizatsi zme unda tsa zakhatu pasho zakhatu zkanu dobo. National dispecherizatsi z kontrole mtliana tari sabitum bazris gan kargo psasulebs. Me ama swa kontrole bunebru emagram mat konda te es konda pira pira chekule ba dats deboli dispecherizatsi as. Zavze saat yani grapi. Tadahlovid Ramden Hashigamos or the Montgomery over the road is never what's out Sathi and Grapiki. Tahos The best and brightest are not working in the energy ministry. He's making decisions and, and obviously getting, uh, getting some type of uh, compensation for it, right? He's not doing what's best for the energy sector. What is your salary? Salim, Papa, Tara, Sasun, Uzdati, Lari. 
you know, these guys have significant power. You know, the potential cost to the state is vast when one of these guys abuses their position. Uh, far, far outweighs the provision of a decent salary to a minister and his key official. Originally, 50% collections and he was going to cut it. But uh, I think he just wanted to grow his hair long. That dispatch center is in charge of the whole nation and there's discretionary decisions being made all the time that involve huge amounts of power and a lot of money, you know? And the power supply to Tbilisi. What happens is the power comes in off of the transmission lines, the tall pylons, into the substation, and there's a big transformer outside. And that's where the high voltage, in this case 35,000 volts, is transformed to 6,000 volts. And these feeders are the 6,000 volt switches. So there may be 5,000 customers on this feeder right here. So that's a powerful switch right there. This is the Chinese embassy's feeder. This is for the Philharmonic. It's my feeder. <laughs> my house. This is the TV tower up at the top there. This is for the government buildings downtown. This is Metro. See? What happens is that they get a call from the dispatch center and they say, turn this on, turn this off. And when it's turned off, uh, there's no power. left here and I got stuck between the third and the fourth floors. My bathroom's got no windows. The light the candles are shaved and it's coming out. <laughs> Cut your face off the time. Somehow you are happier when the lights are on and you go down when the power goes off. Backup power supply situation here, the inverter, turns the battery power into 220 volts AC, and it also acts as a charger, so it charges the battery when the power is on. And I always have power in every room. The fridge is working, the light's on, and then I can run this complex of electrical consumables down here. So what you call high-tech solutions. If it costs money, I mean, you've got to have a fair bit of money. challenging time, interesting time, difficult time, and dramatic also. But at the same time, we enjoy life, you know. To be a genuine Georgian is always, you have to enjoy life even when you are on the edge of disaster. The Caucasus are big and young mountains, steep and deep snow. It was built uh, in the 1980s as a helicopter skiing resort by a joint venture between the Soviets and the Austrians to sort of raise foreign exchange. This is a little hotel we built last year with three friends. Every Friday night I come here to ski for a couple of days and then you know, go back to Tulasi. We've got all our stuff on. Just about to go to the ski lift, and the electricity went off, which means no ski lift. Uh, I love skiing, yeah, because I'm a former skier, so I love skiing. I'm supposed to be with the customers right now. Yeah, let's see. You can ski, well, anywhere really. 
it's quite safe. The Russian helicopters are pretty good. Oh, we worked in Georgia, Turkey, and Azerbaijan. Observed elections in Azer one in Azerbaijan and three in Georgia. The big question with these elections was not really any opposition to President Shevardnadze, but getting the required voter turnout to make the elections valid. Where I was observing, they had 90% uh, turnout by about 10 a.m., although there's only a trickle of voters. I myself saw stuffed ballot boxes, um, chunks of ballots in the box when we opened it, full voter list signed completely by one person. You could tell the signatures. Commission members signed a list in front of us. I know of people who went to vote and had their names already signed. They already voted. The problem right now is getting people organized to, to demand a change, so that's where the work needs to be done. Ubani, Sabamisad, Damajer, leader of Georgia, will be president of his candidate, Edward Chevar. что это якобы размывание принципов. В этом главном для всех нас вопросе компромиссов быть не может. We, we have no telephone line uh, in town, from this building. They cut off all lines. Are you expecting any outside help soon? Yeah, from the wind? The, no. <laughs> There was mayhem in Georgia after independence. There were civil wars. Three parts of the country basically seceded. The mafia groups got rid of Gamsa Khodya, and then Shevardnadze came back. He's got a lot of enemies, you see, because of what happened to the first president, Gamsa Khodya. The most recent attempt was down on the wharf. They had a hit squad with a number of rocket propelled grenades and they blew up a, f a few cars and a number of people died. But he was in this German armored Mercedes, not a scratch inside the car. I would say that uh, Georgia's history as an independent nation is maybe the most dramatic among all post-Soviet states. People want to know what is going on. Why isn't there any power? And when you spend the time with people, talk to people, it, it helps, I think. When you know why you're being affected like that. Sometimes I'm a bit nervous because you can get lynched. That kind of mob thing, you can't control the mob. Maybe you will help us. Yeah, we'll do it. Please help us. 
go to the Minister of Energy and ask that they give power to where we pay. Not us. Ah, in Teta, there's power supply because somebody in the president's family is building a house out there and they wanted a better power supply and there had been a written order given to the National Dispatch Center. So the guy I was with from the um, regional government, an hour before he'd been like, give us power and everything. I said, this is part of the reason because, you know, the dispatch center is under s political criteria. So tell everybody, if you want to know why we don't have power, just tell everybody. And he looked at me and he said, if you, if you will tell no, I know, you go you, crazy. You will see how, how, how I will be killed. Yeah, yeah. We're foreigners, so we have some more latitude, I think. <laughs> Second Ego was the Soviet state structure that took care of all the power supply issues. It's been divided up slowly over the last 10 years. Oh, Mike, yeah, which door are you coming to? I think this AES, this American company, was not fully informed about the uh, tragedy of Georgian electric grid or electric supply. Everyone understands that they need time. Everything cannot be done in one day or one year even. multinational corporation be organized, what would its purpose be? How would it fit together uh, if you were trying to live consistent with your faith? And that has been the journey that I've been on. I think this desire for power, for control, to control others' lives, and control the world around you is, is more seductive than sex, um, more seductive than money. So what we've tried to do here is to rein that in and ask our leaders to voluntarily give up some of their power, most of their power if we can, so that each, in, as many individuals in the organization 
can experience the joy and the excitement of fulfillment from being free to make decisions themselves and therefore have the most fun workplace ever. What we've decided at AES is that we believe that the purpose of business is to serve the world with safe, clean, reliable electricity. I think I need to add that our purpose is to serve the world and to do it in an economically robust and sustainable manner. And this is definitely the man. He's a thinker, you know, he really is. Yeah, I guess he was a son of a sort of rural Washington State family, and there were a number of sons, and four of them are preachers. And he's sort of a preacher for what he does, too. What is the most fun thing to do in business? To make a decision, yeah. At AES, we've taken most of those decisions away from the bosses. It's fun to play on a team, but it's still more fun to be able to shoot the ball. So at AES, we highly prefer that the person selected or the person who the problem it was makes the final decision. Shevardnadze and the rest of the government, I think, want this to work. They realize it's a long, hard trek, and we didn't think it was going to be as long and hard as it is. There's no chance of us leaving uh, on our own unless we are totally frustrated from carrying out our responsibilities. We know that the goal is to have this to be economically sustainable forever. And we're going to work everything we can to make that happen. There is a story that when God was giving the land to the people, all the nations came and uh, received their land. The Georgians were having party, they were drinking wine, and they were late. So there was no land left for them. And then Santa Maria said that, let them give my land. So she gave us her land. So that's why this land is so special. That's the story. <laughs> good power supply in Georgia in the summer and everyone's kind of happy you know the weather's great you know there's fruit falling out of the trees the snow melts in the mountains the water kind of runs off all the hydro stations are producing vast amounts of energy and the country has a surplus <laughs> well this is it this is the uh, symbolic packing up of the office this is a sword full of cognac. I don't know what I'm going to do with this. May was very good in Peter's region. He was doing something like 70% collections uh, across the whole region. He's really got his leaders motivated. I think we're six months away from having this thing working properly. I think it just takes time, you know, we've got organized gradually. Well, we've got good results. We've got 80 five percent collections from suppliers in May, but I did cut it before that. But we did get 49% or something when I cut it. That's hopeful that despite people's problems, they really want to make it happen and they really want to contribute to something. You know, the street fighting of the first two years is still going on, but much less intensity. We're starting to do things now that we've been stuck on for two years, but now it's, these things are starting to move very quickly. It's very interesting what's happening here, you know? It's really coming together, as the country is not, unfortunately. AES is no separate country. Okay, if they're getting payment, that doesn't mean that they, they aren't having problems at all. Georgia is moving definitely down in the aspects of human rights, economy, social life, everything. Whoever is stealing money, whoever is dishonest and actually bad, it has all the opportunities for life, good career, fame, everything. On the other hand, a person who is honest and uh, actually tries to oppose those who are corrupt, they get all kinds of problems. 
Yes, tell us. Yes, Aris. Kitkhor, I'm a little trist. Me or Ena Khwarshi. Everybody liked Georgi Sanaya. He was one of the most popular anchor of news in Georgia. He was managing to elicit the major information that was needed for the public. For the last period of time, he was working on Pankhisi region, which is controlled mostly by Chechens, where all these foreigners are being kidnapped and kept in there. People are evaporating. Some people say really that he was having the cassette showing how Georgian policemen and the kidnappers are negotiating the prices. It means that policemen are uh, actually involved in the process of this kidnapping, which n never ends in Georgia. During this, he was murdered. <laughs> Nobody knows who killed Georgi Sanaya. On the day of his funeral, oceans of people were coming to say the final words to him and everybody was crying. I never seen anything like that before. Georgian people was ready to rise in those days to throw out this terrible government from Georgia. But there was no leader among the public. I miss me headed Rasat's men on a bianes, Shorsapol, the Coricula of Isagan. Shorsapol, the Coricula of Isagan. I continue working because I think that's my mission. I have to say the truth every day. I have to work on it because if I don't work on it, if I don't investigate this terrible, you know, co corrupt people's misdeeds, what am I supposed to say to my children or how can I die without saying to God that I've, I've fulfilled everything what my conscience told me to do in this life. The army is going to be a bit of a fight. I think it's about 1.2 million lari debt, and, or probably more now, and about 80% of it is in our region. They've got this huge debt, and in the winter we're trying to cut them off, and the tanks were coming out. Poor army recruits are sitting around there in the winter in the cold with not much food and no money, and you know, then suddenly the electricity's cut off. We tried in the winter to, to disconnect, and we just couldn't do it. So now it's the summer, we can do it now in the summer. We need leadership now, for sure. We definitely need some kind of gelling force to pull it together. Well, Mike's like a legend here in Georgia. I'm just a completely different person. Being from Venezuela, this is the other end of the world, literally. Okay, you couldn't have picked a more remote, maybe Mongolia. Okay, could have been more remote, but this is this is up there. One of the leading Georgians in the company told me that A.S. Tulasi is Georgia, and if A.S. Tulasi fails, Georgia fails. Now talk about, you know, talk about putting a load on your back, okay? We have a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> I was talking to this parliamentarian, and uh, he was telling me over dinner that, uh, you know, Mike, it doesn't matter about the power supply, it doesn't matter if you get the lights on or not, which I found a bit of a surprise, because everyone's normally shouting to get the lights on all the time, you know? But what he was saying was, he demonstrating to everybody in this country that things can change. And in many ways, that's a model for the Georgia or the whole region.
experience of Michael Scully, who has given his heart not just to this business, but to this country. Members of this society, uh, which are famous Georgian scientists, artists, uh, and uh, uh, other distinguished people in Georgia, uh, they are very happy to welcome Mike uh, and uh, to uh, accept Mike into this society. This is the best winter that Tbilisi has had for the last 10 years. But when 80% or so of the industrial customers, commercial customers, steal, when theft in unremetered areas is 90%, how can you fix it? There's some very advanced and tricky ways that, that customers are stealing. You just have to audit the meter points all the time. So suppose this is a meter. Mm -hmm. It's not it's called. So they switched it and the meter started turning. Mm -hmm. It was working. The meter is stopping, but the customer is getting the electricity. They can, you know, open this up and see ele electronically what's going on. It's technology that serves to, on the one hand, show uh, that it's working, but on the other hand, defeating the meter. It's a really clever thing. I wasn't, I couldn't figure out how it worked, even what it did. Tell you the truth. Transistor you can eat. So this transistor is the kind of alien put into the switch here. When this is heated, this automatically switches the the zero phase, which stopped the meter. I mean, I've never seen anything like it. It's like unbelievable. Very well-educated people with very little money now, right? So it's mind-blowing how they do it. We'll never have a great return on this investment. It, you know, most corporations would just cut it and say, gone. I mean, it's not worth the effort. But, I mean, if we leave, we think it'll have very bad repercussions in the country, so we're fighting to stay. So, but who are we fighting for? Okay, we're fighting for the Georgians. We're fighting because we, I think this is a beautiful country. And it's got incredible level of culture. And, you know, you wish it would have a better future. Six months separate us from September the 11th the Republic of Georgia. Terrorists working closely with Al-Qaeda operate in the Pankisi Gorge near the Russian border. President Shevardnadze's request, the United States is planning to send up to 150 military trainers to prepare Georgian soldiers to reestablish control in this lawless region. This temporary assistant serves the interests of both our countries. Other people may have strategic interests, but AES does not. We're there to serve the people of Georgia. And what the State Department or anyone else uh, has to say, Russia or whoever, we're going to try to just keep focused on Georgia. <laughs> well, much, much has happened since our visit two years ago. The investors in Tallahassee have had zero return. That cannot continue. With the cooperation of the, of the people of Tallahassee and uh, good hard work by our people, uh, we think that there can be 
uh, some economic improvements over the next year or two. I fell in love with Georgia the very first time I came here, and uh, I have been fighting inside the company and uh, working with our own government uh, and with your uh, leaders here to make sure that AES is part of this community for a long, long time to come. But the company is far from out of uh, trouble. When you see that the situation is just getting worse and worse, what is the basis for having any hope? Our lives definitely are uh, sacrificed to this era, an end of communism and corruption. I think that our future is in our hands, so the new generation can improve everything. I'm optimistic. We tried. It's all you can do, isn't it? Is like try your best, and we've really tried. I mean, we've, you know, there's a lot of people working. You know, I've never been involved in anything like this in my whole life. I mean, it's something else. It's never ever really, is it? Shuki, 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 Shuki,